essentially the, the Queen's representative in the Senate. And you heard a protester yelling, uh, if I heard it correctly, there are other parties in Parliament who will support your climate plan, don't let us fall off this cliff. And we expect uh, some conversation, some mention in the speech from the throne of climate change and whether the government plans to uh, take a more ambitious approach. Uh, they know if they do, they will have the backing of uh, three of the opposition parties in Parliament who are demanding uh, stronger action. Um, and so uh, we expect that to feature in the speech from the throne as the Prime Minister and uh, Sophie Gregoire Trudeau make their way inside. And the Senate is now uh, awaiting the arrival of the Governor General, and we expect to see that in the next few minutes. And we will also have a, as I say, a parallel process taking place in the House of Commons, uh, where uh, they elected a speaker. The new speaker of the House is Anthony Rhoda. Uh, and uh, he is the new speaker of the House of Commons, and we can show you back inside with our pool coverage. This is inside the Senate chamber where uh, in, in invited uh, members, uh, senators of course, but uh, also VIPs who have, uh, who are always on hand as, as part of uh, this process. Uh, there are members of the diplomatic corps. Uh, they are uh, various uh, representatives from uh, different agencies, the members of the Supreme Court. Chief of the Defense Staff, Commissioner of the RCMP, Clerk of the Privy Council uh, are in the chamber for the speech. It's a, as I say, it's the temporary uh, Senate building uh, because of the renovations taking place in Center Block. And uh, they uh, are gathering here for the arrival in the next few minutes of the Governor General, and we hope to be able to show you that. And we are also keeping an eye on the process that takes place in the House, which will uh, get underway in the next few moments. And that uh, is where members of Parliament gather, of course, and that's about a half kilometer away. The usher of the Black Rod from the Senate will take a message from the Governor General uh, to the House of Commons asking members of Parliament to come to the Senate to hear the speech from the throne before they return to the House of Commons to then uh, begin conducting the duties of uh, members of Parliament. So we're watching both of these processes take take place and right now the focus is on the Senate and the arrival we think in the next couple of minutes here of the Governor General uh, who will uh, arrive uh, there run with military precision uh, these events are for the most part so within the next minute and a half or so we should see the arrival of the Governor General. In a speech from the throne that is likely to emphasize the, uh, the results of the last election, uh, which is a minority parliament and a government looking uh, to ensure that it can move along an agenda that will get the backing of at least one of the major opposition parties at every stage in uh, the House of Commons. That's what's required to move the program along. So I think you'll hear a, a speech from the throne that talks about the need to uh, cooperate, that talks about in fairly broad strokes, uh, the government's promises made during the election campaign and how it plans to follow them up uh, and how it plans to reach out to other opposition parties as we look at former Governor General Michel Jean, how it plans to reach out to uh, other opposition parties, at least uh, one in every case, to move this agenda forward on issues such as uh, climate change, uh, pharmacare, uh, taxation, uh, economic measures, gun control, um, and various other measures that you can uh, probably put together yourself that have uh, been front and center of the government's promises during the election campaign and the conversation since then. And as we've talked about in our programming today, also looking to see what kind of tone the speech takes and what kind of words it might contain delivered by the Governor General on behalf of the Prime Minister to uh, Canadians in uh, parts of the country and let's talk about Western Canada, Saskatchewan and Alberta in particular feeling uh, left out of the process, feeling alienated, feeling ignored uh, by some of the policies of the government, particularly on the energy and environmental front and we'll see what kind of olive branch is extended to uh, those provinces from a Prime Minister who has already met with 
the premiers, met with mayors of some of the major Western Canadian cities to, to say that he understands the concerns about the economic downturn driven by a drop in energy prices, that he understands it, uh, understands it that he knows what uh, they are saying, but what they want to see is what kind of concrete action he plans to take to address those concerns that they have expressed in those parts of Western Canada where uh, this has inflamed uh, clearly uh, the tensions and uh, issues around national unity. So let me just put you in the picture here and let you watch along as we watch the same image as you're watching and stand by, we think, in uh, the next moments here for the arrival of the Governor General. Arriving, as you see, members of the Supreme Court of Canada, including the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Richard Wagner. And now we expect this will be the arrival of the Governor General.
Peter Van Dusen, uh, CPAC's live coverage of the speech from the throne, and this is the prelude to the speech from the throne, as you've been watching. The Governor General now is uh, out of our camera range now, where she is meeting with the Senate uh, leadership and uh, various Senate groups, and then uh, she will then uh, make her, her way down to uh, the Senate chamber eventually as we continue to look at some of those assembled in the Senate chamber standing by for the speech from the throne. So after she is there, she will then dispatch, uh, or the usher of the Black Rod will then be dispatched to Parliament Hill by the Speaker of the Senate to summon members of Parliament in the House of Commons, the other place, as it's often referred to. Uh, there's the Red Chamber and the House of Commons, the Upper Chamber, uh, the Senate, the Lower Chamber, the House, and MPs will be summoned to attend the speech from the throne at the Senate. And as I've uh, explained before, the Prime Minister is the only elected member of Parliament allowed beyond the bar of the Senate. So he'll be sitting up at the front of the Senate near the Governor General for the speech from the throne. All other members of Parliament, the elected members who, have, who will make their way to the Senate, some, in some cases some already have, and they must remain behind the bar. Uh, they are not permitted to enter the Senate and Senators are not permitted to enter the House of uh, Commons. And that's why the Usher of the Black Rod will be dispatched to the House to call members to the Senate where they will hear the speech from the throne and then they will return to the House of Commons to consider the speech from the throne and uh, formally begin uh, this 43rd Parliament of Canada which begins after the delivery of the speech from the throne and the laying out of the government's uh, writ large blueprint uh, for uh, governing the country, for dealing with the minority parliament, and that will come our way in about uh, 35 minutes from now is when we're, we're expecting it to actually be delivered on the floor of the Senate by the Governor General, who reads the words in the speech from the throne crafted by the Prime Minister and his advisors, and delivered uh, to uh, Canadians in this centuries-old traditional way. So. In a fairly short order, we expect to see the arrival in the chamber of uh, the Governor General and then um, part of this process will move from the Senate to the House of Commons. But as we like to do at CPAC, let's uh, put you in the room with our cameras and let you just see the sights and sounds of the uh, prelude to the speech from the throne, if I can put it that way, uh, as we watch uh, those gathered in the Senate chamber on uh, this important a day in the life of a democratic nation.
Yeah. All right, Peter Van Dusen, as we continue to watch uh, the proceedings in the Senate, the proceedings are underway as well in the House. Let's listen in there. It's a dual-tracked approach. Really Let's listen well. in. I hope this continues for a while. <laughs> <laughs> the sitting of the House will now resume to await the arrival of the Usher of the Black Rod. I have the honour to inform the House that a communication has been received as follows. Mr. Speaker, I have the honour to inform you that Her Excellency, the Right Honourable Julie Payette, Governor General of Canada will arrive at the Senate of Canada building at it says 2:30 here. Uh, okay, <laughs> at 2:30 p.m. on Thursday, the fifth day of December 2019, when it has been indicated that all is in readiness. Her Excellency will proceed to the chamber of the Senate to formally open the first session of the 43rd Parliament of Canada. J'ai l'honneur d'informer la Chambre qu'une communication dont voici le texte a été reçue. Monsieur le Président, j'ai l'honneur de vous informer que Son Excellence, la très honorable Julie Payette, gouverneure générale du Canada, arrivera à l'édifice du Sénat du Canada à 14h30 le jeudi 5 décembre 2020. Lorsqu'il aura été confirmé que tout est en place, Son Excellence se rendra à la salle du Sénat pour ouvrir officiellement le, la première session de la, 40, la 43e législature du Canada. Veuillez agréer, Monsieur le Président, l'assurance de ma haute considération. Et maintenant, nous allons attendre un peu jusqu'à temps que nous avons une visite. Merci beaucoup.
Mr. Speaker, a message from Her Excellency the Governor General. Monsieur le Président, a message to Son Excellence la Gouverneur Générale. Admit the messenger. Faites entrer le messager. Mr. Speaker, it is the pleasure of Her Excellency the Governor General that this honorable House attend her immediately in the Chamber of the Senate. Monsieur le Président, c'est le plaisir de Son Excellence, la Gouverneur Générale, que cette honorable Chambre se rende immédiatement auprès d'elle dans la salle du Sénat. this. All right, Peter Van Dusen with continuing live coverage here on CPAC. You can see members of parliament have been called to the Senate to hear the speech from the throne and uh, we can show you some of the shots now. We'll uh, take you outside and some of them are being, as you can see, uh, black rod. Is, so to be clear again, there's the temporary House of Commons in the, the west block of Parliament Hill and a temporary Senate about half kilometer away. And as you can see, members of Parliament who are headed for the uh, speech from the throne are being boarded onto these mini buses to be taken there to expedite that process to get them down to uh, the new temporary Senate building. Uh, first speech from the throne being delivered from there. Uh, just under uh, a kilometer, a little over a half a kilometer away, and they'll head for that. Uh, they'll hear the speech from the th throne and then they will be returned to Parliament Hill to begin uh, carrying on the business of the 43rd Parliament. And none of that happens uh, in strict terms until after uh, the speech from the throne has been delivered and the government has set out its broad, uh, in broad strokes, its list of priorities and uh, plans for uh, governing in this minority parliament where, as we've said, it will require 
support from at least one of the opposition parties at every turn on any matters of confidence. But uh, in all our discussions and the, the uh, analysis we've been bringing you, it's clear that for the most part there will be lots of potential dance partners in the opposition parties depending on what uh, the piece of legislation is. So there are lots to watch for in the days ahead. Uh, the plan is that uh, the opening of Parliament takes place today. Uh, of course, the first question period will happen tomorrow, and the House will sit again next week, and then we'll be on uh, the Christmas break. It will uh, then uh, adjourn and return on uh, at the end of January for uh, what will then be uh, the rest of the uh, spring sitting right through until June. So these are the MPs being loaded on these mini buses and then driven down to the Senate chamber uh, where the speech from the throne will be delivered by the Governor General, fully expecting it to touch on some of the key things we've been hearing from the government, not just in the election campaign but since. Uh, climate change, uh, taxes, tax cuts for the middle class, uh, gun control measures, we expect uh, to hear about that, uh, national pharmacare, we expect to hear about that, the reconciliation process ongoing with Indigenous people in this country. So there will be many elements in the speech, but don't expect it to be deep on detail. As always, the speech from the throne is more of a blueprint of uh, aspirational goals that the government sets. And we also expect to hear some language in the speech from the throne about how the government plans to address issues around national unity and Western alienation and how the government plans to deal uh, with uh, matters of economic downturns in the different province, which, provinces, which has caused a lot of this anger. But again, as I say, don't expect a whole lot of detail. That will come in the days and weeks ahead and will likely be largely framed around uh, the most important government priorities we will see when we get a budget, likely to be in February or March, when we'll see what kind of funding the government attaches to some of these priorities and that will give us a clear sense of uh, where it is in terms of the most important uh, pledges it is making to Canadians and then how it plans to proceed to win support for those pledges from the opposition parties in the House of Commons. So we're in this period now of uh, suspension as you were in the process while members of Parliament make their way and not all members of Parliament we're told we're, are uh, going to be going to the Senate it's a small space where they can uh, take up a spot to watch the speech from the th throne so they won't all be there I think we'll see a significant representative sample more than uh, 100 plus I'm sure will be there uh, to hear the speech but some will stay behind then once the speech has concluded those members of Parliament will return to the House of Commons You'll hear reactions to the speech uh, in our coverage and you'll hear uh, the actual uh, legislative and political process that takes place in the House of Commons to actually launch the business of government after the speech from the throne has been delivered. Then it will probably adjourn somewhere around 6 o'clock or 6.30 and then uh, return to business tomorrow uh, morning at 10 o'clock. And here are uh, these MPs. This will be uh, the MPs and I believe I saw the usher of the Black Rod in that first vehicle, uh, uh, Greg Peters, he will be uh, stepping out of this and uh, the MPs will then be led into uh, the Senate area, to the bar of the Senate, where the speech from the throne will be delivered. So let's, let me just put you there and uh, let you watch along.
May it please Your Excellency, the House of Commons has elected me their Speaker. Though I'm but little able to fulfill the important duties thus assigned to me, if the performance of those duties I should at any time fall into error, I pray the fault may be imputed to me and not to the Commons, whose servant I am, and who through me the better to enable them to discharge their duties to their queen and country, humbly claim all their undoubted rights and privileges, especially that they may have freedom of speech in their debates, access to their excellency's person at all seasonable times, and that their proceedings may receive from your excellency the most favorable construction. Qu'il plaît à Votre Excellence, la Chambre des communes m'a élu président, bien que je sois peu capable de remplir les devoirs importants qui me sont par là assignés. Si, dans l'exécution de ces devoirs, il m'arrive jamais de faire une erreur, je demande que la faute me soit imputée et non aux communes, dont je suis le serviteur et qui, en vue de s'acquitter le mieux possible de leurs devoirs envers la Reine et le pays, réclament humblement par ma voix la reconnaissance de leurs droits et privilèges incontestables, notamment la liberté de parole dans leurs débats, ainsi que l'accès auprès de la personne de Votre Excellence en tout temps convenable et demandant que Votre Excellence veuille bien être interprétée de la manière la plus favorable leur délibération.
Mr. Speaker. I am commanded by Her Excellency the Governor General to declare to you that she freely confides in the duty and attachment of the House of Commons to Her Majesty's person and government, and not doubting that their proceedings will be conducted with wisdom, temper, and prudence, she wants or she grants and upon all occasions will recognize and allow their constitutional privileges. I am commanded also to assure you that the Commons shall have ready access to Her Excellency upon all seasonable occasions, and that their proceedings, as well as your words and actions, will constantly receive from her the most favorable consideration. Monsieur le Président, Son Excellence, le Gouverneur Général, me charge, me charge de vous dire que, ayant pleine confiance dans le loyalisme et l'attachement de la Chambre des communes, envahir la personne et le gouvernement de Sa Majesté. Et ne doutant nullement que ces délibérations seront marquées au coin de la sagesse, de la modération et de la prudence, elle lui accorde et, en toute occasion, saura reconnaître ses privilèges constitutionnels. J'ai également l'ordre de vous assurer que les communes auront, en toute occasion convenable, libre accès auprès de Son Excellence et que leur délibération, ainsi que vos paroles et vos actes, seront toujours interprétés par elle de la manière à la plus favorable. Honorable sénateurs et sénatrices, députés de la Chambre des communes, mesdames et messieurs, je suis heureuse d'ouvrir la première session de la 43e législature du Canada. Je souhaite la bienvenue aux 98 nouveaux députés ainsi qu'à ceux et celles qui ont été réélus. Your predecessors first sat in Parliament in November 1867. Canada was barely five months old. On the scale of world history, we are still young. Yet much of it's happened in the world since then. We have matured, and we are here, strong and free. There has been no civil war, no foreign armies marching on our soil. There have been agreements and differences along the way. And lots of arguments, yes, most of them delivered with much eloquence in this very chamber. Notre stabilité tient à de nombreuses raisons. Premièrement, nous sommes des millions à avoir le même désir. Que nous soyons nés ici ou ayons choisi d'y venir, nous voulons vivre librement, en paix et en harmonie. Cette quête est une des pierres d'assises de notre nation et elle nous guide dans presque tout ce que nous faisons. Peu importe ce qui nous différencie, nous avançons à l'unisson comme un seul peuple à la recherche de chances égales et de points communs. Ce n'est pas un hasard, c'est un choix. C'est ce qui nous définit. And remember as well that our fortunes have relied often on the knowledge and the strategies of the indigenous people, what I call indigenous genius that allowed this nation to thrive. Their deep understanding of our natural world, their intense sense of community should continue to affect what we do here for the good of our communities and the future of, all, of our children. Kiji Mkweni, Magani Wiwat, Misiwe Anishnabek, Achish Nigan, Abinuchi Shak, Ke Pimadiziwat. Reconciliation must continue. 
La deuxième pierre d'assise de notre stabilité est notre système parlementaire. Votre travail est essentiel car il nous permet de décider ce que nous voulons vraiment en tant que nation. Le système de loi et de tradition qui définit notre entité canadienne est garant de notre mode de vie et trace la voie de l'avenir auquel nous aspirons. Your role in the democratic process is a privilege and a responsibility. I know that you embrace it, respecting the wishes and protecting the rights of us all. Because we serve every single Canadian. Nous sommes au service de tous les Canadiens, quel que soit leur genre, leur confession, leur langue, leur coutume ou leur couleur de peau. C'est peut-être d'ailleurs l'entreprise la plus noble qui nous soit confiée. Et nous partageons la même planète. We know that we are inextricably bound to the same space-time continuum and on board the same planetary spaceship. If we put our brains, our smarts, our altruistic capabilities together, we can do a lot of good. We can help improve the lives of people in our communities, diminish the gaps and inequities here and elsewhere, and have a better chance at tackling serious and pressing issues like climate change, poverty, inequalities, and human rights, because global issues no, no borders, no timeline, and truly need our attention. Je suis persuadé qu'en travaillant de concert, rien n'est impossible. I am convinced that anyone can rise to any occasion if they are willing to work with others, to reach higher goals, and to do what is right for the common good. Cet automne, les Canadiens ont été appelés aux urnes, et ils ont élu un gouvernement minoritaire à Ottawa. Cela reflète la volonté du peuple et vous avez été choisi pour y donner suite. Nous ouvrons donc cette 43e législature en lançant un appel à l'unité dans la poursuite d'aspirations et d'objectifs communs. Ici même, en cette belle chambre, nous reconnaissons que le Sénat du Canada est de moins en moins partisan et des mesures seront prises pour qu'il poursuive sur cette lancée. Nous avons parmi nous des fonctionnaires dévoués qui sont engagés à travailler sans relâche au nom de leurs concitoyens. Les Canadiens ont livré un message clair. Les jeunes, comme les aînés, veulent que leurs parlementaires travaillent ensemble sur les questions qui comptent le plus pour eux. In this election, parliamentarians received a mandate from the people of Canada, which ministers will carry out. It is a mandate to fight climate change, strengthen the middle class, walk the road of reconciliation, keep Canadians safe and healthy, and position Canada for success in an uncertain world. These are not simple tasks, but they are achievable if you stay focused on the people who sent you here. Moms and dads, grandparents and students, new Canadians, business owners, workers, people, from all walks of life. Every one of them expect their parliamentarians to get to work and to deliver on a plan that moves our country forward for all Canadians, including women, members of visible and linguistic minorities, people with disabilities, and members of the LGBTQ2 communities. While your approaches may differ, You share the common belief that government should try, whenever possible, to make life better for Canadians. That includes better health care and affordable housing, lower taxes for the middle class and those who need it most, investment in infrastructure, public transit, science and innovation, less gun violence, and a real plan to fight climate change while creating good, well-paying jobs. But there are a few areas where this parliament can make a real difference in the lives of Canadians. And as much as they have instructed you to work together, Canadians have also spoken clearly about the importance of their regions and their local needs. 
The government has heard Canadians' concern that the world is increasingly uncertain and that the economy is changing. And in this context, regional needs and differences really matter. Today's regional economic concerns are both justified and important. The government will work with provinces, territories, municipalities, indigenous groups, stakeholders, industry, and Canadians to find solutions. Grâce au dialogue et à la co coopération, tous les régions, toutes les régions du pays peuvent surmonter les défis d'aujourd'hui et réaliser leur plein potentiel dans l'économie moderne. Tandis que le gouvernement met en place un plan ambitieux pour faire progresser le Canada, les parlementaires peuvent s'inspirer des Canadiens eux-mêmes. Ces derniers vous ont élu pour accomplir un travail important et ils montrent, au moyen de petits et de grands gestes, ce que vous pouvez faire pour être des parlementaires efficaces, des voisins qui s'entraident, qui placent la communauté en premier, qui trouvent un terrain d'entente, créent des liens et travaillent ensemble. C'est dans cet esprit de collaboration typiquement canadien que le gouvernement et cette législature s'appuieront sur les progrès accomplis lors des plus récents du plus récent mandat et feront du Canada un pays qui profite à tous les Canadiens. Canada's children and grandchildren will judge this generation by its action or inaction on the defining challenge of the time, climate change. From forest fires and floods to ocean pollution and coastal erosion, Canadians are living the impact of climate change every day. The science is clear, and it has been for decades. A clear majority of Canadians voted for ambitious climate action now, and this is what the government will deliver. It will continue to protect the environment and preserve Canada's natural legacy, and it will do so in a way that grows the economy and makes life more affordable. The government will set a target to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. This goal is ambitious, but necessary for both environmental protection and economic growth. The government will continue to lead in ensuring a price on pollution everywhere in this country working with partners to further reduce emissions. En outre, le gouvernement contribuera à rendre les habitations éco-énergétiques plus abordables et instaurera des mesures afin de bâtir des communautés plus vertes, plus éco-énergétiques et plus abordables. Il facilitera le choix des individus d'utiliser les véhicules zéro émission. Il travaillera pour faire en sorte que chaque communauté canadienne ait accès à de l'énergie propre et abordable. Il travaillera avec le milieu des affaires pour faire du Canada le meilleur endroit où établir et faire prospérer des entreprises du secteur des technologies propres. Et il viendra en aide aux personnes déplacées en raison de catastrophes climatiques. The government will also act to preserve Canada's natural legacy, protecting 25% of Canada's land and 25% of Canada's oceans by 2025. Further, it will continue efforts to reduce plastic pollution and use nature-based solutions to fight climate change, including planting 2 billion trees to clean the air and make our communities greener. And while the government takes strong action to fight climate change, it will also work just as hard to get Canadian resources to new markets and offer unwavering support to the hardworking women and men in Canada's natural resources sector, many of whom have faced tough times recently. Canada's experience proves that economic growth is the surest way to maintain a good quality of life for citizens. Over the past four years, Canada has seen tremendous growth. And through it all, the government has worked to ensure that all Canadians benefit from Canada's economic success, cutting taxes, reducing poverty, and creating over a million jobs. And in this new mandate, the government will provide even greater support to the middle class 
and to the most vulnerable Canadians by pursuing tax fairness, continuing to invest in people and growing the economy. As its first act, the government will cut taxes for all but the wealthiest Canadians, give her more money to middle-class family and those who need it most. The government will also act on housing, after drastically reducing poverty across the country in the last mandate, the government will continue its crucial investment in affordable housing. It will also make it easier for more people to buy their first home. The government will give families more time and money to help raise their kids and make before and after school care more accessible and affordable. It will cut the cost of cellular and wireless services by 25 percent. It will strengthen the pensions so that many seniors rely on and increase the federal minimum wage. Understanding that an educated Canada is a successful Canada, the government will give more support to students, be they new graduates struggling with loan repayment or be they heading back to school mid-career to learn new skills. Le gouvernement continuera aussi de mener un programme économique qui bâtit une économie canadienne moderne. Cela signifie aller de l'avant avec le nouvel ALENA afin de maintenir une économie nord-américaine florissante et intégrée. Dans le cadre de cet accord et d'autres accords commerciaux, les secteurs soumis à la gestion de l'offre seront pleinement et équitablement indemnisés. En fait, de nombreux producteurs laitiers recevront leur premier chèque ce mois-ci. Le gouvernement va revoir les règles qui encadrent le nouvel environnement numérique de manière à ce qu'elles soient équitables pour tout le monde. Le gouvernement s'emploie à éliminer les obstacles au commerce intérieur et international pour les entreprises et les producteurs agricoles. Il continuera à faire des investissements ambitieux dans les infrastructures et réduira les formalités administratives pour qu'il soit plus facile de créer et de faire croître une entreprise de démarrage ou une petite entreprise. Et le gouvernement mettra en œuvre un plan financier responsable pour maintenir la vigueur et la croissance de l'économie. Every single person in Canada deserves a real and fair chance at success. And that must include Indigenous people. In 2015, the government promised a new relationship with Indigenous peoples, one that would help deliver a better quality of life for their families and communities. Real progress has been made over the past four years, including the elimination of 87 long-term drinking water advisories, equity in funding for First Nation K-12 education, the passage of historic legislation to protect Indigenous language and to affirm Indigenous jurisdiction over child and family services, and the completion of the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. But we know that there is still much work to do. Reconciliation with Indigenous people remain a core priority for this government, and it will continue to move forward as a partner on the journey of reconciliation. Indeed, when Indigenous people experience better outcomes, all Canadians benefit. Among other things, the government will take action to co-develop and introduce legislation to implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in the first year of the new mandate. Continue to work of eliminating all long-term drinking water advisories on reserves by 2021 and ensure safe drinking water in First Nations communities. It will co-develop new legislation to ensure that Indigenous people have access to high-quality culturally relevant health care and mental health services. And it will continue to work to implement the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action 
and the national inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women and girls call for justice in partnership with First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. Le gouvernement travaillera avec les communautés autochtones pour combler le déficit d'infrastructures d'ici 2030. Il poursuivra les efforts de collaboration pour que les autochtones puissent prendre en main leur destinée et prendre leurs décisions qui concernent leur communauté. Il adoptera des mesures pour s'assurer de respecter l'esprit et l'intention des traités, des accords et des autres ententes constructives conclues avec les autochtones. Il veillera à ce que les peuples autochtones qui ont été blessés par le système d'aide à l'enfance soient indemnisés équitablement et en temps opportun. Et il continuera à investir dans les priorités autochtones en collaboration avec les partenaires autochtones. Le chemin de la réconciliation est long. Cela dit, le gouvernement, dans ses actions et ses interactions, poursuivra sur ce chemin avec les Premières Nations les Inuits et les Métis. Wherever they live, in small rural communities or in big cities, in the foothills of the Rockies or the fishing villages along our coastlines, in the far north or along the Canada-US border, all Canadians want to make Canada a better place for themselves, their children and their communities. But there are challenges in making that better future a reality. Year after year, headline after headline, Canadians have seen firsthand the devastating effect of gun violence. Too many lives lost, too many families shattered. It is time to show courage and strengthen gun control. The government will crack down on gun crime, banning military-style assault rifles and taking steps to introduce a buyback program. Municipalities and communities that want to ban handguns will be able to do so. And the government will invest to help cities fight gang-related violence. Nous sommes aujourd'hui à la veille du 30e anniversaire du meurtre horrible des 14 femmes de l'École polytechnique de Montréal. Une journée où tous les Canadiens s'arrêtent pour rendre hommage à ces femmes qui ont été tuées en raison de leur sexe. Et nous faisons le bilan des torts que la violence sexiste continue de causer à la société canadienne. Le gouvernement fera davantage pour lutter contre la violence sexiste au Canada, en s'appuyant sur la stratégie contre la violence fondée sur le sexe et en collaborant avec des partenaires pour élaborer un plan d'action national. Ensuring a better quality of life for Canadians also involves putting the right support in place so that when people are sick, they can get the help they need. The government will strengthen health care and work with the provinces and territories to make sure all Canadians get the high quality care they deserve. The government will work with provinces, territories, health professionals and experts in industry and academia to make sure that all Canadians can access a primary care family doctor. The government will partner with provinces, territories and health professionals to introduce mental health standards in the workplace and to make sure that Canadians are able to get mental health care when they need it. And the government will make it easier for people to get the help they need when it comes to op opioids and substance abuse. Canadians have seen the widespread harm caused by the use of opioid in this country. More needs to be done, and more will be done. Too often, Canadians fall, who fall sick suffer twice, once from becoming ill, and again, from financial hardship caused by the costs of their medications. Given this reality, pharmacare is the key missing piece of universal health care in this country. The government will take steps to introduce and implement national pharmacare so that Canadians have the drug coverage they need. Finalement, le gouvernement continuera de reconnaître son devoir solennel 
d'appuyer les personnes qui choisissent de servir dans les forces armées canadiennes. Dans son dernier mandat, le gouvernement a investi plus de 10 milliards de dollars afin d'obtenir de meilleurs résultats pour les anciens combattants. Puis, dans cette nouvelle législature, le gouvernement s'appuiera sur le travail déjà réalisé en améliorant le soutien aux soins de santé mentale et en prenant des mesures pour que tous les anciens combattants sans abri aient un endroit où vivre. Canadians expect their leaders to stand up for the values and interests that are at core to Canada's prosperity and security, democracy, human rights, and respect for international law. Canadians expect the government to position Canada and Canadians for success in the world. As a trading nation, the government will seek out opportunities for Canadian commerce, ingenuity, and enterprise. As a coalition builder, the government will build partnerships with like-minded countries to put Canada's expertise to work on a global scale in areas like the promotion of democracy and human rights, the fight against climate change and for environmental protection, and the development and ethical use of artificial intelligence. Le Canada est un allié, et le gouvernement apportera sa contribution aux efforts multilatéraux pour faire de ce monde un endroit un peu plus sûr, juste, prospère et durable. Le gouvernement renouvellera l'engagement du Canada à l'égard de l'OTAN et du maintien de la paix dans le contexte des Nations unies. Il défendra l'ordre international fondé sur les règles lorsque cet ordre est remis en question, surtout lorsqu'il s'agit du commerce et des enjeux numériques. Et il continuera de veiller à ce que la voix du Canada soit entendue à l'ONU et en particulier au Conseil de sécurité de l'ONU. Finalement, le Canada est un partenaire compatissant et le gouvernement fournira des ressources ciblées pour l'aide au développement international, notamment pour investir dans l'éducation et l'égalité des sexes. Il aidera les personnes les plus pauvres et les plus vulnérables du monde à améliorer leur qualité de vie et à ensuite devenir de solides partenaires du Canada. Chers parlementaires, les Canadiens comptent sur vous pour lutter contre les changements climatiques, pour renforcer la classe moyenne, pour parcourir le chemin de la réconciliation, assurer la santé et la sécurité des Canadiens et placer le Canada en position favorable pour assurer sa réussite dans un monde incertain. Et je sais que vous pouvez y arriver grâce à votre bonne volonté, à votre humilité et à votre empressement à travailler ensemble. N'hésitez pas à fixer des exigences plus ambitieuses en ce qui a trait à la façon de faire de la politique au pays. Après tout, le gouvernement sait qu'il doit travailler avec les parlementaires pour obtenir des résultats. Le mandat de cette récente élection est un point de départ et non le dernier mot. Le gouvernement est réceptif aux nouvelles idées provenant de tous les parlementaires, les partis intéressés, les fonctionnaires et les Canadiens. Des idées comme les soins de dentaire universels méritent d'être étudiées et j'encourage le Parlement à le faire. Whether it's fighting money laundering or making parental benefits tax-free, there are good ideas across parties and this government is ready to learn from you and work with you in the years ahead. Some believe that minority governments are incapable of getting things done. But Canada's history tells us otherwise. Canada's parliament is one of the most enduring and vital institutions in the democratic world. It has delivered a tremendous way of life for the Canadian people through crisis and prosperity, through majority and minority governments. On December 31, 1966, Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson welcomed Canada's centennial year and lit the centennial flame in front of the Parliament buildings for the first time. In his remarks, he said, Tonight we begin a new chapter in our country's story. 
Let the record of that chapter be one of cooperation and not conflict, of dedication and not division, of service, not self, of what we can give, not what we can get. Let us work together as Canadians to make our country worthy of its honored past and certain of its proud future. In this 43rd Parliament, you will disagree on many things, but you will agree on a great many more. Focus on your shared purpose, making life better for the people you serve. Never forget that it is an honor to sit in this Parliament. Prove to Canadians that you are worthy holders of those seats and worthy stewards of this place. Members of the House of Commons, you will be asked to appropriate the funds to carry out the services and expenditures authorized by Parliament. Honourable members of the Senate and members of the House of Commons, as you carry out your duties and exercise your responsibilities, may you be guided by divine providence. All right, Peter Van Dusen, you see, uh, as members of Parliament now leave the bar of the Senate, having heard the speech from the throne and make their way back uh, to the House of Commons to uh, then uh, finish out another couple of hours worth of uh, business related to the speech from the throne and the opening of Parliament. As we watch uh, these shots uh, from uh, our cameras at, uh, at the uh, Senate of Canada as they leave, and inside as well, the Governor General takes her leave after delivering the speech on behalf of the Prime Minister and his government.
now the justices of the Supreme Court of Canada uh, taking their leave as well, saying goodbye to the Speaker of the Senate, George Fury. Okay, so as we, re, we uh, leave the uh, coverage now from the Senate as the uh, show you the uh, slate from the House of Commons where we'll go back to our coverage there shortly as uh, members of Parliament who have been at the Senate, as you see attending the speech from the throne, are now making their way back to uh, the House of Commons. And as soon as they arrive back there, they will take up uh, responses to the speech from the throne and uh, move ahead with uh, some of the basic uh, parliamentary work flowing from the speech from the throne. Let's talk a little bit about the speech from the throne as we wait for that. We uh, will have those members of parliament back in their seats in the House of Commons shortly and uh, we'll uh, continue our coverage from the House. So, uh, well, uh, we heard the speech from the throne and was it as expected? Uh, a commitment to cooperating with the other parties, a pledge to be more ambitious in fighting climate change with uh, the government committing to net zero emissions by 2050, something it had talked about during the election campaign, and that's something uh, that will be pursued by a number of the opposition parties in the House who will push for that, and in some cases they'll want more than that. Uh, the speech from the throne, read by the Governor-General, the words of the Prime Minister, uh, pledges to continue the process of reconciliation with Indigenous people, promises those tax cuts for the middle class. The government says it'll be its first act. The first order of business will be to pass those tax cuts. Uh, affordable housing, gun control, uh, and a crackdown on gun crime, and uh, a, a, a nod to national pharmacare, but with few de details on national uh, pharmacare. As I say, the words are the Prime Minister's, but... Uh, according to tradition, the speech is delivered by the Governor General. And uh, we heard also, we were looking for some tone and uh, some notes about uh, perhaps uh, how the parties could work together in the, the minority parliament that Canadians have elected, and we heard some of that. Uh, some of it was simply, as you heard towards the end of the speech, this call that some people think minority parliaments can't work and don't deliver, but uh, the speech suggesting the opposite. Many great achievements have been made in minority parliaments and suggesting there's room to raise the bar in politics by having all parties and members of the different parties cooperate and work together. I think what was also significant in the speech was not only did it talk about cooperation, but it talked about ideas. In the case of conservatives, for instance, uh, talking about the, the need to look at good ideas no matter where they come from in a minority parliament and, parliament and talking about money laundering, for instance, and uh, tax-free maternity benefits, which were proposed by conservatives during the campaign. And on the, the NDP side, uh, saying that, look, uh, Yes, we want to talk about moving ahead on pharmacare. It talked about a national pharmacare plan. Is that going to be a national, universal, single-payer plan that covers all Canadians? Or is it to ensure that Canadians who don't have the coverage now do end up having it with a national pharmacare plan? So those are questions that you're going to hear from uh, the opposition leaders when they start coming to microphones in the next little bit uh, for their responses to the speech from the throne. And we can show you this is a shot of a microphone uh, on uh, Parliament Hill. We're standing by uh, to get reaction from uh, different party leaders at that microphone. The next little bit we'll have that for you as well. But uh, as I was saying, with the NDP talking about pharmacare, yes, which the NDP campaigned heavily on during the election campaign, but also suggesting, look, it might be worth looking at dental care, which was another proposal uh, from the New Democrats. So there will be uh, lots of reaction to the speech. Does it uh, is it what the opposition parties were expecting? I suspect largely they will say this is what we expected to hear, sort of broad brush plans about the government's approach to governing and the government's uh, priorities and whether those priorities reflect the interests of uh, opposition parties because as we've said the government requires the support of at least one 
of the opposition parties on every one of the measures it hopes to pass. If they are confidence measures, the actual survival of the government could be imperiled uh, if they lose one of those confidence votes. So they'll be looking to pass legislation, pass uh, and survive confidence votes with the backing of at least one opposition party. So is there enough here for all the parties to find something? Uh, probably for at least a couple of the opposition parties. Uh, for the Conservatives, maybe not. They've been making it clear in the last couple of days that they are uh, here to oppose uh, Justin Trudeau, and I'm not sure whether they've heard enough in the speech from the throne today that suggests anything different. My, my guess is we'll hear Andrew Scheer uh, probably come down pretty hard on not necessarily all of these proposals, but on whether Justin Trudeau will deliver, whether he's representing uh, the, the Canadians that the Conservatives think need to be represented. So we'll hear some of that. But for New Democrats and the Bloc, the Bloc's already made it pretty clear that it's in no rush to bring down the government. And then uh, the NDP uh, has been a little tougher in its language the last couple of days. So it'll be interesting to hear their response to this because there have been a number of touchstones in the speech uh, that uh, people have, uh, have uh, singled out. Now, this is Pablo Rodriguez, the government house leader, so let's listen to what he has to say. Together, and this is exactly what the throne speech reflects. Now, let's go to work. The 21 October, the Canadians have sent a message. They've understood. They want to collaborate, we want to work together. Et c'est ce qu'on retrouve dans le discours du trône maintenant, mais on, on passe au travail. Vous expliquez qu'un vote euh, n'est pas nécessairement obligatoire sur un discours du trône. Quelles sont vos intentions au gouvernement? Est-ce que vous mettrez cette... cette, cette il, va, il, va, il va très certainement y avoir un, un vote. OK. Comment vous comptez, je disais, pour travailler ensemble? Euh, il y a des perches d'anciens peuples du monde dans ce discours-là. Moi, j'ai eu la... Comment vous voulez travailler avec eux? C'est du cas par cas. Et ça va toujours être du cas par cas. Euh, J'ai eu l'opportunité de rencontrer euh, les trois leaders du gouvernement cette semaine, celui des conservateurs, du NPD et du Bloc. Euh, J'ai senti de l'ouverture à vouloir collaborer ensemble. C'est sûr que euh, ça va être du cas par cas. Dans, dans certains cas, par exemple, sur euh, des projets ou des projets de loi qui touchent euh, la réduction des gaz à effet de serre, c'est peut-être plus naturel d'avoir des discussions avec le NPD ou le Bloc dans le cas de la réduction euh, des impôts pour la classe moyenne. Break away from the House leader because they are back uh, getting into session here in the House of Commons, so let's uh, go there. J'ai l'honneur de rapporter que les communes s'étaient rendues au Sénat sur l'invitation de Son Excellence, la gouverneure générale. J'ai informé Son Excellence que j'avais été désigné président. En votre nom, j'ai réclamé les privilèges accordés d'ordinaire qu'il a plu à Son Excellence de bien vouloir vous confirmer.
Order. À l'ordre. Monsieur Trudeau, appuyé par Monsieur Rodriguez, demande à présenter un projet de loi concernant la prestation des serments d'office. Cette motion est réputée adoptée. Mr. Trudeau, seconded by Mr. Rodriguez, moves that the bill be now read a first time. This motion is deemed adopted. First reading of this bill, première lecture de ce projet de loi. I have the honor to inform the House that when this House did attend Her Excellency uh, this day in the Senate chamber, Her Excellency was pleased to make a speech to both House of Parliament and to prevent mistakes. I have obtained a copy which is as follows. Shall I dispense? Agreed. Thank you. Monsieur Trudeau, appuyé par Monsieur Rodriguez, propose que le discours du trône que Son Excellence a prononcé aujourd'hui devant les deux chambres du Parlement soit pris en considération plus tard aujourd'hui. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Yes. Carried. Je désire informer la Chambre qu'en conformité d'une demande faite par le gouvernement conformément à l'article 55.1 du règlement, la présidence a fait publier un feuilleton spécial donnant avis de motions émanant du gouvernement. Je dépose donc sur le bureau du, du, euh, le document pertinent. J'ai l'honneur d'informer la Chambre que les députés suivants ont été nommés à titre de membres de bureau de régie interne aux fins et en vertu de disposition de leur loi, la loi sur le Parlement du Canada, paragraphe 52. The Honorable Mr. Leblanc, Honorable Mr. Rodriguez, member of the Queen's Privy Council, the Honorable Mr. Holland, the Honorable Petitpa Taylor, Representative of the Government Caucus, l'honorable Madame Bergen et Monsieur Stroll, représentant du caucus du Parti conservateur, Madame Bellefeuille, représentant du caucus du Bloc québécois, Monsieur Julian, représentant du caucus du Nouveau Parti démocratique. I'm sorry. Le président de, du, du Conseil du Trésor. Merci, M. le Président. Je propose, appuyé par le leader du gouvernement en Chambre, que la Chambre étudie les travaux des subsides à sa prochaine séance. Et pendant que je suis ici, M. le Président, été, ayant été moi-même un page en 1984, j'aimerais souligner avec grand plaisir la présence de la nouvelle cohorte de pages. Les remercie à l'avance pour les travaux et les services importants qu'ils rendront à cette Chambre. Monsieur Duclos, appuyé par Monsieur Rodriguez, propose que la Chambre étudie les travaux de subsides à sa prochaine séance. Plaît-il à la Chambre d'adopter cette motion? Adopté. It is my duty to inform the House that a total of one day will be allotted to the supply period ending December 10th, 2019. Orders of the day. Prise en considération du discours de Son Excellence, le Gouverneur général, aux deux chambres du Parlement. L'honorable ministre. Le message de Son Excellence portant la signature de la secrétaire de la Gouverneur générale pourrait vous être remis.
For Excellency, the Governor General transmits to the House of Commons the supplementary estimates A of sums required to defray expenses of the Federal Public Administration for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2020, in accordance with Section 54 of the Constitution Act, 1867, recommends those estimates to the House of Commons. Son Excellence, la Gouverneur Générale, transmet à la Chambre de, des Communes le budget supplémentaire des dépenses à faisant état des fonds nécessaires au financement de l'administration publique fédérale pour l'exercice si, se terminant le 31 mars 2020, conformément à l'article 54 de la loi constitutionnelle de 1867, recommande ce budget à la Chambre des communes. L'honorable président du Conseil du Trésor. Oh, excuse, l'honorable du chef du uh, the House Leader. <laughs> Merci. Merci, Monsieur, Monsieur le Président. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there have been discussions among the parties, and if you seek it, I believe that you will find unanimous consent for the following motion that notwithstanding any standing order or usual practice of the House until Tuesday, December 10, 2019, standing order 81-5 be replaced with the following. Supplementary st estimates shall be deemed referred to a committee of the whole House immediately after they are presented in the House. A committee of the whole shall consider and shall report or shall be deemed to have reported the same back to the House no later than one sitting day before the final sitting or the last allotted day in the current period. On a day appointed by a Minister of the Crown, consideration of the supplementary estimates shall be taken up by a committee of the whole at the ordinary hour of daily adjournment for a period of time not exceeding four hours. During the time provided for consideration of estimates, no member shall be recognized for more than 15 minutes at a time, and the member shall not speak in debate for more than 10 minutes during that period. The 15 minutes may be used both for debate and for posing questions to the Minister of the Crown or a parliamentary secretary acting on behalf of the Minister. When the member is recognized, he or she shall indicate how the 15 minutes is to be apportioned. At the conclusion of the time provided for the consideration of the business pursuant to this section, the committee shall rise, the estimates shall be deemed reported, and the House shall immediately adjourn to the next sitting day. Standing Order 8114A be amended by replacing the words to restore or reinstate any item in the estimates with the following. 24 hours written notice shall be given to restore or reinstate any item in the estimates. <laughs> Standing Order 541 be amended by adding the following. Notice, notice, notice respecting a uh, motion to restore or reinstate any item in the supplementary estimates A for the financial year ending March 31st, 2020, shall be laid on the table of, or filed with the clerk within four hours after the completion of consideration of said supplementary estimates in committee of the whole or be printed the, in the notice paper of the day. Nonobstant l'article 83.1 du règlement, le Comité permanent des finances soit autorisé à présenter son rapport sur les consultations prébudgétaires au plus tard le 28 février 2020. Nonobstant tout article du règlement pour la session courante, lorsqu'un vote par appel nominal doit avoir lieu un mardi, un mercredi ou un jeudi, à l'exception des votes par appel nominal différés à la conclusion des questions orales, la sonnerie d'appel des députés fonctionnera pendant au plus 30 minutes. Le jeudi 5 décembre 2019, la Chambre continue de siéger au-delà de l'heure ordinaire de l'ajournement quotidien jusqu'à l'ajournement du débat sur l'adresse en réponse au discours du trône. Le vendredi 6 décembre 2019, la Chambre se réunisse à 9h30 pour permettre à un député de chaque parti reconnu et à un député du Parti vert de chacun faire une déclaration d'une ma période maximale de cinq minutes à l'occasion du 30e anniversaire des événements tragique à l'École polytechnique de Montréal et que la Chambre observe par la suite un moment de silence et procédera ensuite à l'ordre du jour. Bravo. That's it.
L'honorable ministre a-t-il le consentement unanime de la Chambre afin de proposer la motion? D'accord. The House has heard the terms of the motion. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? So carried. Orders of the day. Consideration of a speech of Her Excellency the Governor General to both Houses of Parliament. Debat. Debate. L'honorable député de Brown, Mississauga. Monsieur le Président, je voudrais débuter en prenant un instant pour vous féliciter de votre élection. Il ne fait aucun doute que vous serez un président juste et impartial que les parlementaires et les Canadiens respecteront. Monsieur le Président, je suis honorée d'être ici, à la Chambre des communes, aujourd'hui, afin de représenter les citoyens de brome missisquoi je tiens d'ailleurs à les remercier de m'avoir fait confiance et de m'avoir élu en tant que député. Je leur en suis très reconnaissante <rire> et je travaillerai d'arrache-pied pour bien représenter l'ensemble de nos citoyens au cours de mon mandat. Quand j'ai pris la décision de faire le saut en politique, c'était avec un triple objectif. Aider les autres, écouter les gens et essayer de faire une différence. Utiliser tout ce que j'ai appris dans le sport pour l'amener au niveau public pour être encore plus près des gens. Je crois que le gouvernement a la même approche en ce sens qu'il veut bâtir sur ses acquis et ses apprentissages pour être plus près de la population canadienne et de bien répondre à ses besoins. Lors des dernières quatre années, le gouvernement libéral a fait des progrès concrets en agissant pour investir dans la classe moyenne, faire croître une économie qui profite à tous et protéger l'environnement. Toutefois, il a encore beaucoup à faire. En octobre, les Canadiens ont fait le choix d'avancer et miser sur les progrès qu'ils ont réalisés, tout en nous rappelant l'importance pour nous, parlementaires, de travailler ensemble, de mettre la communauté en premier et de trouver des terrains d'entente. Comme Son Excellence la Gouverneure générale l'a mentionné, les Canadiens nous ont donné le mandat de gouverner le pays, mais, mais nous ne pourrons pas remplir ce mandat sans travailler ensemble. Notre gouvernement est résolu à collaborer avec les autres parties de la Chambre, de même qu'avec les administrations provinciales et municipales, afin d'obtenir les meilleurs résultats possibles pour les Canadiens et Canadiennes. La population canadienne veut un gouvernement qui se concentre sur les enjeux qui sont près d'eux, comme le renforcement de la classe moyenne et l'aide aux personnes qui en ont le plus besoin, la lutte contre les changements climatiques et assurer la santé de la sécurité des Canadiens et Canadiennes. Notre gouvernement s'engage dans le présent discours du trône à prendre des actions concrètes en matière de ce qui peut être qualifié du plus grand défi de notre époque les changements climatiques. Pour ce faire, notre gouvernement s'engage à fixer l'objectif d'atteindre la cible de zéro émission nette d'ici 2050. Je comprends que cet objectif est ambitieux, mais il est aussi nécessaire tant sur le plan de la protection environnementale que pour la croissance économique du pays. Au sujet de l'environnement, le gouvernement prendra des mesures afin de préserver le patrimoine naturel du Canada. Je suis certaine que mes concitoyens de brome missisquoi en sont très heureux, considérant que notre belle circonscription compte deux lacs frontaliers qui sont source d'eau potable pour nos, nos communautés, le lac Manfrémagogue et le lac Champlain. Avec l'engagement du gouvernement de rendre les communautés plus écologiques, de purifier l'air et d'avoir des solutions axées sur la nature pour lutter contre les changements climatiques, nous pouvons fièrement regarder vers un avenir plus vert pour nos communautés. Parlant de nos communautés, il est important de se rappeler que ces dernières sont composées d'individus qui font face à différents défis, tant au niveau social qu'économique. 
Notre gouvernement s'engage très rapidement à réduire l'impôt des Canadiens afin de remettre plus d'argent aux familles de la classe moyenne et aux personnes qui en ont le plus besoin. D'ailleurs, les solutions aux problèmes et défis de demain devront être trouvées par les futurs leaders du Canada. Conséquemment, notre gouvernement offrira un plus grand soutien aux étudiants. Ceci va du nouveau diplômé avec des difficultés avec le remboursement de son prêt jusqu'à la personne qui doit retourner à l'école afin de, se faire, de faire l'acquisition de nouvelles compétences. Nous nous engageons à être présents pour les étudiants canadiens. Toutefois, avant que ces personnes soient des étudiants, ils seront des enfants qui auront besoin de services et de la présence de leurs parents. C'est pourquoi notre gouvernement s'est engagé à donner plus de temps et d'argent aux parents afin de les aider à élever les Canadiens de demain. Pour ce faire, notre gouvernement s'engage à améliorer l'accès aux services de garde tant au niveau des heures auxquelles elles seront disponibles qu'au niveau de l'accessibilité financière de ces services. Le gouvernement a à cœur nos aînés et les travailleurs du Canada. Deux façons dont le gouvernement veillera à leur bien-être est par l'augmentation des pensions et du salaire minimum fédéral. De plus, la poursuite annoncée des investissements du gouvernement en matière de logement abordable et la facilitation de l'achat d'une première habitation permettra d'aider à ce que les Canadiens aient un toit sous lequel dormir. Finalement, notre gouvernement allègera le fardeau financier des ménages en réduisant de 25 les frais de téléphonie cellulaire et de services sans fil. Le bien-être des Canadiens et des Canadiennes n'est pas qu'une question de revenus, d'équilibre travail-famille ou d'accès au logement. C'est aussi une question d'avoir accès aux soins dont ils ont besoin quand ils en ont besoin. C'est pour cette raison que notre gouvernement travaillera de concert avec les provinces et territoires afin d'améliorer les soins de santé pour les Canadiens, que ce soit par la facilitation de l'accès à un médecin de famille ou la mise en place de normes en matière de santé mentale dans les milieux de travail. Tel que mentionné dans le discours du trône, les Canadiens et Canadiennes qui tombent malades font souvent face à deux épreuves. La première est de devoir affronter la maladie. La deuxième est d'avoir des difficultés financières liées au coût des médicaments. Pour cette raison, notre gouvernement s'engage à prendre des mesures visant la création et la mise en place d'un régime d'assurance médicaments. Depuis le début de mon allocution, je parle des membres de la communauté canadienne. Mais qui sont ces membres? Outre des jeunes, des aînés, des travailleurs, des étudiants et des parents, ce sont des innovateurs, des agriculteurs, des artistes, des entrepreneurs. Ce sont nos familles et nos voisins. Pour qu'ils puissent s'épanouir et que le Canada s'épanouisse avec eux, il est nécessaire, nécessaire que notre gouvernement mène un programme économique visant à bâtir une économie moderne pour le Canada. Et comment bâtit-on une économie moderne, Monsieur le Président? On le fait en maintenant une économie nord-américaine florissante et intégrée. On le fait en révisant les règles entourant le nouvel environnement numérique afin qu'elle soit équitable pour tous et toutes. On le fait aussi en éliminant les obstacles au commerce intérieur et international, en investissant dans les infrastructures et en facilitant la création et la croissance d'entreprises en démarrage ou de petites entreprises. Finalement, on le fait en mettant en place un plan financier pour maintenir la vigueur et la croissance de notre économie. C'est d'ailleurs ce que notre gouvernement s'est engagé à faire dans le cadre du, président, du présent discours du trône. La communauté canadienne inclut aussi les peuples autochtones, qui font trop souvent face à des enjeux plus spécifiques que ceux que j'ai mentionnés depuis le début de mon présent discours. C'est pourtant, comme l'a rappelé son Excellence la gouverneure générale, le génie autochtone qui a permis à notre pays de se développer et de s'épanouir, et leur connaissance, jointe à leur esprit de communauté, devrait continuer de guider nos actions. Pour continuer de bénéficier des connaissances des peuples autochtones, il est important que l'effort de réconciliation entamé dans le précédent Parlement continue de, et s'approfondisse. C'est pour cette raison que notre gouvernement a indiqué 
que la réconciliation avec les peuples autochtones consiste en une de ses priorités fondamentales et qu'il continuera de travailler à la mise en œuvre des appels à l'action de la Commission de vérité et de réconciliation, de même que des appels à la justice émanant de l'enquête nationale sur les femmes et les filles autochtones disparues ou assassinées. Parmi les mesures mises à la, de l'avant dans le discours du trône, je suis particulièrement fière de notre engagement à aller de l'avant avec l'élaboration et le dépôt d'un projet de loi visant la mise en œuvre de la Déclaration des, des Nations unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones durant la première année du présent mandat. Pendant trop longtemps, les peuples autochtones ont vécu dans des conditions peu enviables. C'est pour cette raison que notre gouvernement s'engage à poursuivre le travail pour faire lever tous les avis à long terme en ce qui a trait à la qualité de l'eau potable sur les réserves d'ici 2021 et qu'il s'assurera que l'eau soit potable dans les communautés des Premières Nations. C'est aussi pour cette raison que le gouvernement travaillera avec les communautés autochtones pour combler le déficit d'infrastructures d'ici 2030 et qu'il élaborera un projet de loi visant à faire en sorte que les peuples autochtones aient accès à des soins de santé et des services de santé mentale de qualité supérieure, tenant compte des besoins culturels. Notre gouvernement poursuivra les efforts de collaboration avec les peuples autochtones dans le développement de ces mesures, de même que dans l'adoption des mesures visant à s'assurer à respecter l'esprit et l'intention des traités, des accords et d'autres ententes constructives qui ont été conclues avec les Autochtones. Comme je l'ai mentionné précédemment, les Canadiens et Canadiennes veulent un gouvernement qui assure leur sécurité. Conséquemment, le gouvernement s'engage à en faire plus pour lutter contre la violence sexiste au Canada, que ce soit en collaborant avec des partenaires afin d'élaborer un plan d'action national ou en s'appuyant sur la stratégie contre la violence fondée sur le sexe. Les crimes commis avec armes à feu sont un fléau présent sur le territoire canadien. C'est pour cette raison que le gouvernement interdira les armes d'assaut de type militaire et permettra aux municipalités et aux communautés désirant d'interdire les armes de poing de le faire. Monsieur le Président, depuis le début de mon allocution, je parle de la communauté, tant au niveau local que national. Mais il est important de se rappeler que nous vivons dans un monde de plus en plus interconnecté et que, conséquemment, il est important que le Canada assume son rôle dans la communauté mondiale. La population canadienne est une population généreuse, pleine de compassion, pour qui le partage est important et qui est empreinte d'une conscience environnementale. Comme l'a indiqué la gouverneure générale, les Canadiens et les Canadiennes comptent sur leurs dirigeants pour défendre leurs valeurs et leurs intérêts, tant à l'échelle nationale qu'à l'échelle mondiale. Pour cette raison, j'applaudis l'annonce de notre gouvernement d'établir des partenariats avec des pays qui partagent nos valeurs et notre vision afin que le monde puisse profiter de l'expertise du Canada dans plusieurs domaines, tels que la protection de l'environnement et la lutte contre les changements climatiques, la promotion des droits et la personne, de la personne et de la démocratie. Je crois personnellement que l'intérêt du gouvernement envers les franges de la population étant le plus dans le besoin peut aussi se transposer à l'échelle internationale. Je crois que le gouvernement est d'accord avec mon point de vue, car il vient de s'engager à fournir des ressources pour le développement international, notamment pour investir dans l'éducation, l'égalité des sexes, de même qu'en aidant les personnes les plus pauvres et les plus vulnérables à améliorer leur qualité de vie. Sur une note plus personnelle, j'ai confiance en nos régions, nos jeunes, nos créateurs et nos entrepreneurs. Les gens qui nous entourent doivent rester au cœur de nos priorités et agir comme une inspiration pour notre travail quotidien. J'ai travaillé fort au cours des dernières années pour en arriver où je suis aujourd'hui. J'ai fait preuve de détermination durant toute ma vie afin de dépasser mes limites. Mais je l'ai toujours fait grâce à l'appui de ceux qui m'entourent. J'ai bien l'intention de continuer à avancer. Vite! <rire> en tant que députée, 
avec la même vigueur et la même détermination que je l'ai fait précédemment. C'est pourquoi j'ai confiance en notre gouvernement et que je crois qu'il est le véhicule qui m'aidera le mieux à faire avancer ma circonscription et mon pays. Toutefois, s'il y a une chose que mon passé d'athlète m'a appris, c'est qu'il est beaucoup plus facile d'avancer en équipe qu'en faisant cavalier seul et que bien souvent, les accomplissements en sont encore plus savoureux. Conséquemment, j'anticipe avec fébrilité l'occasion de travailler avec les membres des deux côtés de la Chambre afin d'améliorer le sort des Canadiens et Canadiennes d'un océan à l'autre. Je propose, appuyé par l'honorable député de West Vancouver Sunshine Coast, Sea to Sky Country, que l'adresse dont le texte suit soit présentée à son Excellence, la gouverneure générale du Canada. À son Excellence, la très honorable Julie Payette, chancelière et compagnon principal de l'Ordre du Canada, chancelière et commandeur de l'Ordre du mérite militaire, chancelière et commandeur de l'Ordre du mérite des corps policiers, gouverneur général et commandante en chef du Canada. Qu'il plaise à votre Excellence, nous, sujets, très dévoués et fidèles de Sa Majesté, la Chambre des communes du Canada, assemblée en Parlement, prions respectueusement votre Excellence d'agréer nos humbles remerciements pour le gracieux discours que Votre Excellence avait adressé aux deux chambres du Parlement. Merci. Madame Bessette, appuyée par M. Wheeler, propose que l'adresse dont le texte suit soit présenté à Son Excellence la Gouverneure générale du Canada, à Son Excellence la très honorable Julie Payette, chancelière et compagnon principal de l'Ordre du Canada, chancelière et commandeur de l'Ordre du mérite militaire, chancelière, commandeur de l'Ordre du mérite des corps policières, gouverneur général et commandante en chef du Canada. Qu'il plaît, Votre Excellence, nous, nous, sujets très dévoués et fidèles de Sa Majesté, la Chambre des communes du Canada, assemblée en Parlement, prions respectueusement, Votre Excellence, d'agréer nos humbles remerciements pour les gracieux discours que Votre Excellence avait adressés aux deux chambres du Parlement. Questions et commentaires, l'honorable député de Beauce. Monsieur le Président, Permettez-moi de remercier tous les électeurs de la circonscription de Beauce, que je suis très fier de représenter le berceau de l'entrepreneurship. Les petites et moyennes entreprises sont un des piliers importants de notre économie, plus particulièrement dans les régions. Elles donnent de l'emploi à des centaines de milliers de gens et créent de la richesse partout au pays. Malheureusement, ce gouvernement les a attaqués de plein front en affirmant qu'elles servaient à moins d'impôts, à payer moins d'impôts, qu'elles affrontent quand on sait que ce sont souvent des entreprises familiales qui travaillent d'arrache-pied pour joindre les deux bouts. Une des demandes des quelques 200 000 PME est justement que le gouvernement réduise la paperasserie qui les empêche de réussir. Est-ce que le gouvernement va enfin comprendre et aider les PME du pays au lieu de les insulter et de leur mettre des bâtons dans les roues. Bravo! L'honorable député de Bron-Missisquoi. Oui? Je remercie mon collègue pour la question. Euh, comme j'en ai, ai parlé dans mon allocution, euh, l'objectif du gouvernement, c'est vraiment de travailler en équipe. Donc, je pense que toutes les, les, euh, 
concern, si je peux dire, euh, vont, être, vont être étudiés en équipe et je pense qu'on peut trouver une solution. Merci. Questions et commentaires. L'honorable député de... Non? Non. Il y aurait un changement. OK, excusez. L'honorable député d'Avignon, la métisse matane, Matapédia. Monsieur le Président, je suis heureuse de voir que la lutte au changement climatique fait partie des priorités du gouvernement. Chez nous, au Bas-Saint-Laurent et en Gaspésie, comme partout ailleurs, on ressent déjà les effets les plus néfastes des changements climatiques. Les gens d'Avignon, Lamitis, Matane, Matapédia voient l'érosion de leurs berges s'accélérer et les agriculteurs voient leurs récoltes affectées par l'imprévisibilité du climat. Force est d'admettre, Monsieur le Président, que le gouvernement essaie de plaire à tout le monde en essayant d'allier la croissance économique de certaines industries polluantes à la lutte au changement climatique. Ce sont deux combats qui ne peuvent évidemment pas être menés parallèlement. Il faut investir à d'autres endroits que dans les Trans Mountains de ce monde. Comment le gouvernement compte-t-il atteindre ses ambitieuses cibles en matière de lutte au changement climatique s'il continue à investir dans des projets qui sont néfastes pour notre environnement? Bravo! Bravo. Le député de Brown, Mississippi. Je remercie ma collègue pour la question. Euh, je comprends très bien votre point de vue parce que je, je suis moi-même dans un, une circonscription où on a des lacs et des rivières et énormément de, de points d'eau et on a les mêmes problèmes. Donc, je pense que ça va être une question que moi aussi, je vais poser au gouvernement puis qu'ensemble, je crois qu'on va être capable de trouver des solutions. Merci. Questions et commentaires. Questions and comments, the Honorable Member for Hamilton Center. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to congratulate you on your preferment and through you, if I could, congratulate my friend, the Honorable Member, on her speech. Mr. Speaker, I can appreciate her exuberance, although I do not share it. Canadians need action and they need it right now. We've heard these words before. The question through you, Mr. Speaker, is will this government act now on re reconciliation by stop dragging Indigenous kids to court? Will this government act now on climate change and not wait until 2050? Will this government act now on affordable housing, including social housing? Will this government act, Mr. Speaker, on a pharma care system that is truly national and public? Public and comprehensive. L'honorable député de Brome, Mississauga. I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. Uh, I will answer in English. Um, the government is ready to do the effort that is needed for the environment. They know there's a lot to do, but we are ready, and we we definitely want to work together to try to achieve those those goals that we have uh, put on papers. And we want them to be real. Thank you. <coughs> Questions et commentaires. Questions and comments. The honourable member for Kildonan St. Paul. Mr. Speaker, with my first ever question in the House of Commons, I'd like to thank the people of Kildonan St. Paul. They elected me on a mandate to fight for everyday Canadians, and that's exactly what I plan to do. We know there are troubling economic times on the horizon, and as we heard today, this government's only plan is to spend more taxpayer dollars. And yet, while reckless government spending is at a record high, it has done nothing to help people get ahead. Nearly half of all Canadians are only $200 away from not being able to pay their bills. Meanwhile, this Liberal government is only making life more expensive and jeopardizing the lives of or the futures of everyday Canadians and young Canadians. And while extra costs might not matter to millionaires like the Prime Minister and many of his colleagues, we know that Canadians cannot afford life getting more expensive. That is the reality, Mr. Speaker. Can the member opposite tell us why the Liberal agenda is so out of touch with the financial challenges facing Canadian families? <laughs> Before we go, before we go to the next or to the answer, I just want to remind the honourable members that taking personal slights at people it does not really help things. So I just want to point that out, and hopefully that will work. Thank you. 
Thank you, my colleague, for your question. I would like to say that the government has been doing a lot of work to try to reduce taxes and income tax to the, the medial class family, uh, families, and I think we're going to keep going in that direction. Hopefully, we can, we can all work together to make everybody happy, which is almost impossible, but to try to reach an equality and a unity. unity. Thank you. Questions et commentaires. Questions and comments, l'honorable député de Saint-Hyacinthe-Bagotte. Alors, merci, M. le Président. Permettez-moi tout d'abord de saluer euh, chaleureusement les électeurs de Saint-Hyacinthe-Bagotte qui m'ont accordé leur confiance le 21 octobre dernier. Je ferai tout dans mon pouvoir pour être à la hauteur de la tâche. Euh, M. le Président, il y a un proverbe oriental qui dit que la santé, c'est le trésor de la vie. En matière de santé, le discours du trône présente des belles intentions. On en est content. Euh, et pour cause, d'ailleurs, hein, parce que beaucoup de nos concitoyens nous font part de leurs inquiétudes. Il faut cependant que les bottines suivent les babines et que les bonnes intentions débouchent sur des solutions. Or, il y a une façon de faire, tout en respectant la juridiction du Québec, et c'est l'augmentation des transferts fédéraux aux provinces, lesquels assument la pression de la hausse des coûts en santé. Lundi dernier, dans le cadre de la réunion du Conseil de la Fédération, tant le gouvernement du Québec que ceux des provinces canadiennes se sont entendus pour réclamer une hausse des transferts en santé. Le gouvernement s'engage-t-il à donner suite à cette demande? L'honorable député de Brom, Mississippi. Merci à mon collègue pour sa question. Une question un peu difficile pour moi. Par contre, ce que je peux vous dire, c'est que la santé, ça me tient à cœur. Ayant été une athlète olympique pendant plusieurs années, c'est une, une grande importance dans ma vie. Donc, je peux vous assurer que côté santé, le gouvernement va faire ce qu'il faut pour essayer d'aider justement les provinces pour que notre, nos Canadiens et nos Canadiennes soient en santé et puissent profiter de leur magnifique pays. Merci. Avant de reprendre euh, le débat, I just want to remind everyone, so if you, while you're giving your speech, uh, keep an eye on the speaker. I have a clock right here that tells how much time we have left. And normally what I do, if it's a 20-minute speech, I'll give you a five-minute, then a three, and a one. And if it's a 10-minute, I'll go three and then one. So it just gives you an idea where it's at. I know some of you are new, and that's something that it takes a while to catch up with. But uh, I just thought I'd make it easier, and uh, it helps us all stay on time and makes life uh, a little bit more pleasant for all of us. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Alors, je vais le répéter en, en français, si vous, si vous voulez. Euh, ce qui s'est passé, c'est dans le passé, ce que je faisais avec un discours de 20 minutes, euh, ce que je fais normalement à euh, 5 minutes, je donne un, un signe avec euh, 5 doigts pour les 5 minutes, ensuite 3 minutes, et ensuite 1 minute, et ensuite on finit. Avec un discours de 10 minutes, ce que je fais, c'est euh, un, euh, un signal de 3 minutes, et ensuite 1 minute, et ensuite euh, ça nous donne une idée où on est rendu. Alors, on va euh, continuer. Uh, resuming debate, the Honorable Member for West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, Sea to, si sea to Sky Country. Mr. Speaker, before I begin, I would like to offer you my congratulations on being elected today. You play a central role in the work that we all do here, and I wish you well. Tenoya Amash Astren Tu Moshena Chichi Yat Taulate Sisha. It is an honor to rise in this chamber today and to second the motion of my esteemed colleague, the member of Brome Misikwa regarding the address in reply to the speech from the throne. Canadians have delivered our government an, an ambitious mandate to improve their lives, strengthen this country, and bolster Canada's place in the world. Today's speech from the, from the throne provides our government a roadmap on how to get there. Over the next few minutes, I will speak with pride to this House about some of the details of how we plan to navigate through this roadmap. 
But first, Mr. Speaker, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to the people of West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, Sea to Sky Country. They have given me the privilege to serve them in this House of Commons as, as their Member of Parliament. I want to thank my constituents for placing their trust in me. I am grateful to my constituents from all corners of our large and diverse riding, and I would like to recognize the thriving communities in Pemberton, up the Sunshine Coast, and those on Bowen Island. Every day I take my seat in this chamber, I will never forget why I'm here, to serve the people in my constituency and to help build a better Canada. And before going further, I'd also like to have a special thanks to, to my, my family and especially my partner, Nicole, who have supported me in this endeavor and often doing the, the hard work behind the scenes, which is often a thankless job. Uh, indeed, Mr. Speaker, I believe the speech from the throne has provided us all with a reminder of the responsibilities that have been entrusted for us. Millions of Canadians cast their votes in the election this October, and they have sent us all a very clear message. Canadians want their politicians to put the public interest first. They want us to work together on the things that matter to them, to their families, and to their communities. They have elected a minority government with an important agenda to fight climate change, strengthen the middle class, and help create good, well-paying jobs, to make life more affordable for Canadians, to continue to uh, firmly on the path of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, to keep our citizens safe on our streets with less gun violence, to strengthen our health care system and modernize it for the 21st century, to provide more affordable housing, to provide investments in infrastructure, public transit, science and innovation, uh, and, and finally, to secure Canada's place in this world. Mr. Speaker, these are just some of the important challenges that lie ahead of us. They are challenges not just for the government, but for all parliamentarians. It's that simple. We all have a mandate to find common ground in this parliament. The government is ready to work hard to make historic, historic progress in all of these areas. I am confident that with goodwill, my colleagues from all sides of the House can work together to make the changes that Canadians want. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, I know we can come together as parliamentarians. I've seen it in my work before being elected to this House. As an environmental and natural resource management lawyer, I have seen firsthand what can happen when people collaborate. I have supported governments around the world to improve the management of aquatic ecosystems as well as the governance of natural resource sectors on behalf of the United Nations and other international development agencies. I have represented First Nations, municipalities, small businesses, nonprofits on environmental and, uh, and corporate legal matters. It is not unusual, Mr. Speaker, for people to come to the table with very different interests. But it's also not unrealistic for them to walk away with a shared agenda and common goals. It happens in communities throughout the country. It can happen here in the House of Commons. That spirit of cooperation can also happen as leaders throughout our country work together to find solutions on our shared challenges. Mr. Speaker, as someone who, has, who was born and raised in West Vancouver and the Sunshine Coast, I am proud that the speech from the throne has spoken clearly about the importance of all of our country's regions and their local needs. This government knows that the economic concerns being felt by Canadians in our regions are real. It is listening to Canadians in those regions. On this, Canadians can be sure. The government will work with provinces, territories, municipalities, indigenous groups, stakeholders, industries, and Canadians to find solutions. Mr. Speaker, there is no greater challenge facing this country, and indeed this world, than fighting climate change. The science on this growing threat to our planet is clear. It is undeniable. Already we are seeing the effects. Devastating floods and forest fires, coastal erosion, and pollution of our oceans. The changes to the world we, we know now will only grow worse, spiraling faster and faster in the coming years and decades. We are leaving a world to our children and our grandchildren that could be much different than the world that we have grown up in. We recognize this threat, we must act, and we must do our best to fight this threat. 
I believe strongly in this government's pan-Canadian framework on clean growth and climate change. I'm committed to building upon this groundbreaking plan to ensure that Canadian businesses will seize upon the immense economic opportunities that are involved in the transition to the clean economy of the 21st century. Over the past four years, our government has provided national leadership to take action on climate change. In October's election, the, a clear majority of Canadians voted in favour of ambitious climate action. The speech from the throne has made it clear that this government will deliver. We will set a target to achieve net zero emissions by 2050, and our goal will be ambitious but necessary as we both protect the environment while we grow the economy. We have already taken the lead in ensuring that there is a price on pollution throughout the country. We will continue working with our partners to reduce emissions in the years ahead. There are many other important measures that this government will take. We will help make energy efficient homes more affordable. We will make it easier for Canadians to buy zero emissions vehicles. Whistler is already leading the way in this, in changing our transportation habit, habits. Last month, I, I attended uh, the Electric Vehicle Sustainability Summit in Whistler to talk about how governments and companies can work together to achieve our zero emissions targets. Also, Mr. Speaker, we will work towards making clean and affordable power available in all of our communities. We will work with companies in the transition to the clean, energy, clean technology future. An example of this is Huron Clean Energy in Squamish, which is facing the climate crisis head on. It's just one example of the companies providing the technology and the solutions we need in our transition to the low carbon economy. Their leadership in the field of carbon capture is turning our home riding into a hub uh, for clean technology. Mr. Speaker, over the last four years, our country has experienced strong growth, but too many Canadians have difficulty keeping up with the rising costs of living. Our government is determined to take action to make life more affordable for Canadians. And the speech from the throne has identified some of the areas where we'll be taking action on behalf of our citizens. We will cut taxes for all Canadians except the wealthiest. This will provide more money in the pockets of hard working class Canadians that need it the most. We will continue to take action with significant investments in affordable housing. Too many Canadians are unable to buy their first home. We will also introduce measures to make it easier for more people to purchase their homes. This government will take action to ease the concerns faced by workers, families, and seniors. We will assist parents with the time and money they need to raise their children. We will support students as they bear the, high, or the costs of higher education and skills training. We will increase the federal minimum wage. We will reduce cell phone bills by 25%. We will strengthen pensions for our seniors. And as we take these measures, we'll press ahead with an economic agenda that benefits all Canadians in the years ahead. Our government is committed to moving ahead with the new NAFTA agreement with the United States and Mexico. We will continue to make significant investments in infrastructure throughout the country, and we will work to tear down the trade barriers now faced by businesses and farmers when they look to achieve success both internationally and domestically. And as we are doing all this, Mr. Speaker, our government will stay focused on growing the economy with a fiscal plan that is responsible. The speech from the throne has placed a great emphasis on a key pillar of this, another key pillar of this government's agenda. Four years ago, we promised to put Canada on a path towards reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. For far too long, our country neglected to take the actions that have been necessary to give Indigenous peoples a real shot at success. We said that must change, and we took the first steps on that road to reconciliation. It is a long road, but we have seen real progress in just four years. 87 long-term drinking water advisories have been eliminated. There is greater equity in funding for First Nations education. Parliament has passed legislation to protect Indigenous languages and affirm Indigenous jurisdiction over child and family services. 
and the national inquiry into missing and, and murdered Indigenous women and girls held important hearings and delivered its report. But this is just the beginning. The work towards reconciliation has not ended. This government is con con committed to doing more, and here are just some examples. We will work towards eliminating all drinking water, um, all long-term drinking water advisories on reserve by 2021. We will co-develop and introduce legislation to implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in the first year of our mandate. We will co-develop legislation so that Indigenous peoples have access to culturally relevant and high-quality mental health care um, and uh, quality health care services. And we will ensure that Indigenous peoples who have been harmed under the child welfare system that has been discriminatory will be comp compensated in a fair and timely manner. And we will live up to the spirit and intent of treaties, agreements, and other arrangements with Indigenous peoples. Mr. Speaker, one of any government's top responsibilities is to provide a place for its citizens where they can feel safe and where their quality of life is good. In recent years, Canadians have increasingly seen stories in the media um, about deaths in the communities as a result of gun violence. Each of these violent episodes has been a tragedy. Too many Canadians have been killed. Too many relatives have grieved the loss of a loved one. Our government has pledged to act. We will crack down on the gun crime that is haunting too many of our communities. We will ban military-style assault rifles and take steps to introduce a buyback pro program for the weapons. We will work towards giving municipalities that want to ban hand, uh, handguns the ability to do so. Mr. Speaker, in each of our communities, and indeed within our own families, there is often no more important issue as the ability to access high-quality health care. For many decades now, Canadians have recognized that a publicly funded universal health care system, Medicare, is what makes us strong as a country. As we head into 2020, more than a half century after the birth of Medicare, it's important that we, take, we, we all work together as Canadians to strengthen and to modernize it. The speech from the throne has laid out an ambitious but achievable agenda to, to make that happen. Our government will be working with the provinces and territories to strengthen the health care system so that Canadians get the service they deserve. Too many Canadians can't get access to primary care family doctors and to mental health care. We will work with provinces, territories, and health professionals to change that. The scourge of opioid and substance abuse has also cost too many lives and shattered too many families. We need to do more to help people struggling with their addictions. And finally, it is time to bring Medicare into the 21st century. Modern-day medicine means physicians are increasingly able to treat their patients through medication. And yet, too many, too many patients who fall ill are unable to afford the costly prescriptions um, that they are prescribed. And so, they become even more sick. Mr. Speaker, this is just not fair. As the speech from the throne says, pharmacare has become the key missing piece of the universal health care in this country. And our government will take steps to introduce and implement a national pharmacare program so that Canadians have the drug coverage they need. I look forward to all members of this House working together to achieve this historic objective. As we, look, as we look towards improving the lives of Canadians, we must never forget that we have a responsibility to also promote, promote our core values on the international stage. Those values include the promotion of democracy, protection of human rights, and respect for international law. Our government will work in, in the tradition of being a coalition builder globally in these areas. We will stand up for the rules-based international order. And we will renew our commitment to NATO and to the United Nations peacekeeping missions. Canada's voice will be heard at the United Nations, particularly in the Security Council. And we will not forget that Canadians are a compassionate people. We will provide targeted funds for international development, including for education and gender equality. 
I would like to conclude, Mr. Speaker, by returning to where I began earlier in my remarks. Canadians have sent us here to work constructively on their behalf. As the speech from the throne reminds us, our role in this democratic process is a privilege and a responsibility. Indeed, we have been reminded that we are here to serve everyone, regardless of gender, faith, language, custom, or skin color. We are here to make a better Canada. I believe the speech from the throne has provided us all with a roadmap of how to travel that road. And I would, encourage, I would encourage members to join together and work in collaboration as we move forward. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Regina Wiscana. Mr. Speaker, it is an honour and a privilege to rise here today in the House of Commons to represent the interests of Regina Wascana. <laughs> Canada is more divided than ever before. Deep cracks are showing in our Confederation. Under the Liberals, our economy has been bleeding jobs, particularly in the natural resource sector. The Prime Minister has overseen the cancellation of more than $100 billion in investment in energy projects, largely because of the concerns over the No More Pipelines Bill, C-69, and the tanker ban, Bill C-48. The Montreal Economic Institute said recently, people are giving up on Canada as a safe place to invest in natural resources. It's seen as a very hostile environment now. Mr. Speaker, people in my riding and my province of Saskatchewan are concerned that no one in the Liberal government is listening. Yes. And there's absolutely nothing concrete in today's throne speech to address these very real concerns. Yeah. Can the member opposite please tell the House what this government will do to repair the damage they have done to the resource sector and to national unity? For West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, Sea to Sky Country. Um, Mr. Speaker, I would like to, to start by, by thanking my, um, the member opposite for his question. Um, the, uh, over the last four years, we've brought in a, a new way of assessing in, um, industrial projects through the Impact Assessment Act. This, this, is a, this is a piece of legislation that went through a long period of, of consultation and negotiation, and we now have an ability to assess projects in a way that is, that is going to assess the impacts, but also do it in a time-bound manner. We need to have certainty in these types of projects so we can ensure that we hear the voices, we can properly assess them, and that good projects can actually get built. And that's what we accomplished through this new legislation, and this is, gonna, this is what's going to serve us well going forward. Forward, so we do actually have those projects built. Um, in addition to that, in addition to that, this government has has heard loud and clear the concerns of different regions of this country, and for that region, for that reason, we we have we have focused on on having different members of our caucus to be the eyes and ears within Western Canada and in Quebec, and that is going to be a major focus going forward. Questions and comments, questions and commentaires, l'honorable député d'Abitibi, Tris Camagne. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Permettez-moi d'abord de remercier les citoyennes et les citoyens de la circonscription dabitibi témiscamingue qui m'ont accordé leur confiance. Aujourd'hui, Étant député d'une région agricole, je suis heureux, voire soulagé, de constater que dans le discours du trône, des engagements de pleine indemnisation ont été offerts pour nos producteurs sous gestion de l'offre. Je euh, veux ainsi saluer la confirmation que les producteurs de lait recevront un premier chèque d'ici la fin du premier, présent mois. D'autant plus que le Bloc québécois a travaillé fort pour que ce dossier débloque. Pour avoir travaillé de près avec eux à la Fédération régionale de l'UPA d'habitivité Miscamingue, je sais que bien plus que des indemnisations, ce que nos producteurs agricoles veulent, c'est qu'il y ait simplement plus de brèches dans la gestion de l'offre dans les accords commerciaux. 
Conséquemment, est-ce que le gouvernement s'engage à ce qu'à l'avenir, il n'y ait plus jamais de brèche dans les accords de gestion de l'offre? Merci. The Honorable Member for West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, C2 Sky Country. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to start by thanking my, my colleague opposite for the, the question. And, um, and this government is committed to, to working hard on behalf of, of our farmers and our um, supply management, uh, dairy farmers, producers. And that's why when we negotiated the new NAFTA, we, we've included um, ways of, of compensating the uh, supply managed farmers for, for the um, uh, increase in people that are going to be accessing our markets. And going forward, we're going to be focused on working with all Canadians to strengthen the current industries that we have and also be supporting the development of new industries. And for that reason, for instance, we're going to be focused on creating the, um, um, the conditions so we can move forward in the future and benefit from the, the uh, clean energy economy of the 21st century. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Nunavut. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Uh, the Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. My apologies. Mr. Speaker, it's an honour to uh, be able to stand in this House for the first time and represent the members of Edmonton Strathcona that, that uh, were kind enough to trust me to represent them in this House. Yeah. Students in Alberta are really suffering. Uh, the cost of university and college is skyrocketing. And young people are unable to pay for their education. They are graduating with crippling debt of over $27,000. And worse than that, the federal government has been profiting off the back of our kids. This government has given away billions to the most profitable corporations by forgiving their loans while keeping our students on the hook. So why was there nothing in this throne speech to help Canadians, Canada's young people who are struggling with student debt? Good question. The Honourable Member for West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, Sea to Sky Country. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the uh, member opposite for her question. And uh, the, the concerns of, of all Canadians, and especially students, are top of mind of this government. For that reason, in our platform, we committed to, to not uh, having uh, student loans be payable until you make $35,000. This will make a very big difference for people, so that they're not actually being charged interest on their loans until they're in the position they're able to repay them. So it's really important that we do have the, we're creating the success or the, the conditions for success for our young people as they move into their new careers. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? The Honourable Member for Port Moody, Coquitlam. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to begin by congratulating my fellow MPs in this room for their hard-earned election. And I'd like to congratulate you, Mr. Speaker, for your election today. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to stand here today to speak on behalf of the great people of Port Moody, Coquitlam. And I want to take this opportunity to thank them with all my heart for putting their trust in me to represent them here in the House of Commons. My desire as a Member of Parliament is to help improve the quality of life of my constituents and to help them prosper. Home ownership is a basic aspect of individual security and flourishing. Mr. Speaker, the residents in my riding are worried about the cost of living and buying a home is often out of reach for young people, young families and even those with substantial savings. That's right. The throne speech did not address the concerns raised by many in my riding about the mortgage stress test. The housing plan they have put forward will do nothing to help the hardworking Canadians in my community who are dreaming of buying a home. Will the member opposite tell the House when the government will put forward a real plan that addresses and will resolve the reality that people are living through in my riding? Good question. Good question. The Honourable Member for West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, Sea to Sky Country. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the, the member from Port Moody, Coquitlam, for her question. 
Um, housing affordability is a top concern throughout the country, but particularly in the lower mainland. And for this reason, we've, we've committed to increasing the first time home buyers incentive. So this makes life more affordable for people getting their first homes. Um, and, and going forward, we're, we're also going to be looking at developing more, more affordable housing through the national housing strategy. It's a 10 year, $40 billion plan to make actual real action and investments. And so we can have everybody has a safe place to live and a roof over their head. Reprise du débat, resuming debate, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Merci beaucoup et félicitations à tous les députés qui ont participé uh, dans ce débat. Congratulations to the members of Parliament who gave speeches and who asked questions of those two members. I must say my preference was for uh, the questions more than the speeches, but uh, uh, we'll hear some more about this tomorrow. Obviously, I have a different perspective on the throne speech that we all heard today, but I think it would be more appropriate for me to expound on that uh, tomorrow instead of today. So I move, seconded by the member for Aurora Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill, that the debate be now adjourned. Best idea all day. <laughs> Mr. Shear, seconded by Ms. Alicev, moves that the debate be now adjourned. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Yes. Carried. <laughs> the Honourable uh, Honourable Leader du Gouvernement à la Chambre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, on a point of order, I'd like to inform all honourable colleagues that tomorrow shall be the first day of debate for the address in reply to the speech from the throne. Et j'aimerais aussi noter que la Chambre va se réunir demain, tel que mentionné à 9h30, à l'occasion du 30e anniversaire des événements tragiques de l'École polytechnique. Et on va reprendre l'adresse lundi pour ensuite passer à l'étude en comité plénier du budget des dépenses supplémentaires A, déposé plus tôt cet après-midi. Et mercredi, jeudi et vendredi prochain seront dédiés au débat sur l'adresse. Et M. le Président, mardi sera un... prochain sera un jour désigné. Et en terminant, M. le Président, je propose, appuyé par le ministre du patrimoine que la Chambre ajourne maintenant. Monsieur Rodriguez, appuyé par M. Guibault, propose que la Chambre s'ajourne maintenant. Plaît-il à la Chambre d'adopter cette motion? Oui. Adopté. Pursuant to order made earlier today, the House stands adjourned until tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.